All right, welcome to Full Momentum and HEC RAS podcast. My name is Ben Carey. I'm your host today. Uh, joining me is Chris Goodell and a special guest who we'll get to here in a second for you guys. Uh, quickly, before we get into the content for today's uh, podcast, I just want to give a quick plug to a HECRAS 1D, 2D class that Chris and I will be teaching on May 20th. And you guys can find the information to sign up for that class in a link uh, at the bottom of this video, as well as on either of our LinkedIn pages. You go, go check that out. So check out Chris Goodell on LinkedIn or Ben Carey, and you'll find more information on that. It's going to be a, a six-week course with uh, lecture sessions each week, followed by workshops that uh, you'll be able to do and we'll be able to review uh, as a as a as a class team, so really cool opportunity for everybody who's wanted to take a one D two D class from Chris, uh, and obviously that'll be offered online now. So a really cool opportunity. You want to say anything about that, Chris? No, thanks for uh, thanks for introducing that, Ben. That's uh, it's going to be a great opportunity. Uh, I'm really excited about this because you know up until now I've really done all my classes in person, and, and this is a great way to reach out to folks uh, who who just can't travel you know, to the classes, uh, whether they don't have the budget for it or whether it's just too far away and logistically not not possible. So super excited about this opportunity. But what I'm also excited about is that we've got Craig Price here on joining us today. So Craig, welcome in. Uh, I want to say something really quick about Craig before uh, we have a little conversation. And uh, I first got to know Craig uh, through the RAS solution, actually, and he reached out to me several years ago. Um, showing an interest in doing some HECRAS training. And he actually brought me to Australia, the first time I'd ever been to Australia, to teach a class there with him. And that was a lot of fun. It was an awesome time. And then uh, we followed that up with another class in New Zealand uh, about, what, another, like a year after that, I think. And uh, so that's how I got to know Cray. So we taught classes together. He was actually at the very first Pub and Grub in Portland. Um, I do some webinars with Cray, or we have done webinars through the Australian Water School. And if you haven't seen Cray's uh, videos, the YouTube videos, they're awesome. They're not only great HECRAS resources, but they're funny. They're fun to watch. So I highly recommend you check those out. <laughs> Cray, welcome into Full Momentum. How are you? Thanks. I'm excited to, um, yeah, to be a part of this uh, this time around. And um, yeah, I hope this is a long-term thing i hope you get people tuning in just uh you know having a having a beer at the end of the week and uh listening to some heck raz banter so um <laughs> yeah i'm excited excited let's to uh, you know kind of, kind of bring the pub and grub online <laughs> let's do it we should do a pub and grub theme full momentum i think at some point that would be a lot i of agree sense. i agree <laughs> uh maybe the next one but hey uh Cray, so for those of you who don't know cray actually lives in australia but you can tell maybe by his accent that he's uh, not native born australian so cray tell us how you uh you got to australia what you're doing there and how long you've been there and everything yeah, thanks. Um, just a quick intro then. Um, I spent, geez, almost 20 years with uh, Tetra Tech. Um, I was working for Simons Lee and Associates um, when they got bought up by Tetra Tech uh, way back in the 90s. And uh, yeah, I had a, a good career with them and um, decided to go out on an adventure to do some reconnaissance in Australia to see if there was a market here. And it was a temporary assignment. And when it ended, um, we decided to stay. Um, and uh, geez, because we liked Australia, but I think even if we hated Australia, I've got six kids and uh, trying to move back overseas um, after getting established here, I, I think I hate moving worse than anything. So um, I think even if we hated it here, we would have stayed. Um, so yes, we're now uh, Australians, dual citizens. We are Australian citizens as well, but um, back when traveling used to be a thing, um, used to get out and teach some classes occasionally. Um, and uh, most of what I do here in Western Australia is consulting for the mining industry, trying to keep uh, keep water out of the mining pits and keep the mining pits out of the water. So that's uh, that's most of what I do in my consulting life. Yeah, very cool. So um, your company, Surface Water Solutions, you started what about two years ago? I want to say. Uh, does that sound about yeah, right? Yeah, about two. Well, it was right when yeah, right when when you came out to Australia. I think it's been three now. Um, and yeah, oh, yeah that's that's, right. that's okay. when I when I we kind of broke out uh, on my own. Um, 
as, as a consultant, it's a little scary to take that dive, but it gives me the opportunity to get involved with, um, you know, a, you know, to a, a whole lot more uh, variety of, of work. Um, I can kind of pick and choose uh, where to go and what to do. And uh, scary as it is to jump off that cliff, it's also been a really fun adventure. Well, you know, the other cool thing that you get to do when you own your own business is you get to take an entire summer off and travel around the U.S. with your family, right? <laughs> oh, if you call yeah. that a, a, a vacation, <laughs> that that was, uh, yeah, we did some heck grass classes along the way, and uh, that that was that was extraordinarily crazy of us to do, but we figured uh, some of our kids hadn't even been to the U.S. If we're going to do it once, let's see everything. We saw 44 of the 48 contiguous states and uh, put 25,000 Ks, well, thinking miles, 15,000 miles on our rental car. When we turned it in, they were not happy <laughs> looking at the mileage. And that's a, so yeah, uh, that was an adventure. That's in case you all missed it earlier. That's a family of eight traveling around the entire United <laughs> States for three months. So I was fortunate enough for Trey to uh, swing by Portland uh, and we timed up the Heck Raz, the very first Heck Raz Pup and Grub um for his uh brief time here in portland and then he came over and we had some barbecue at, at my house that was a lot of fun so it was good to meet your family cray um so it, with uh surface water solutions besides mining work uh, obviously you're doing a lot of heck raz modeling what are some of the other types of projects you do uh well in australia uh, most everybody is standardized on two flow um heck is a bit uh, uh unknown here and um so I, I do teach some courses here every once in a while and i do some heck modeling when they'll let me um but uh, a lot of what we do here is two flow and a lot of uh, the modeling questions that we get into the things we put on the youtube channel and the things that show up on the blog don't just help you for heck they help you for Mike and uh, you know Delf and any any other products that you're looking at, you know current numbers and things like that. You got to understand that no matter which project uh, or product you're working with. Um, so yeah, I don't do a whole lot of Hecaraz modeling um, here locally, but um, that uh, that's what I do when I get uh, get overseas. So yeah, a little bit with the mining, um, but uh, also um, here in in Australia they. You know, it's the land of droughts and flooding rain. So there's also uh, <laughs> right. uh, never a dull moment. <laughs> there's there, a, a right? lot of other projects, uh, water related. Yes. <laughs> Good job security for water resources engineers. Uh, that's what I always Craig, say. I have, Craig, I have a question for you. Um, so, sure. working when you, whenever you do do HECRAS modeling in Australia, are there any um, special considerations that you have to take that maybe people in the states uh, wouldn't be accustomed to or? Uh, wouldn't be normal for HECRAS modeling in the in the states. Oh, you know what I love about being here is I don't have to deal with clomers or lomers or floodways <laughs> and uh, FEMA. <laughs> yeah. So no, I, that's uh, yeah. Uh, special considerations here is just uh, you know the rainfall patterns. Um, we've got to make sure that uh, we're doing everything according to the local guidelines, and um, you know you've got to do that on your own. Um, you got to be a hydrologist separately from your hex modeling, then put your hydrology into HECRAS. So anywhere else on the planet, um, you know everybody's going to have their own rainfall patterns and everything else, and um, it, it it's probably not not going to be built into HECRAS. So you'll have to do that on your own. So that's one special thing that we have to always get into is the hydrology. Cray, one of my favorite videos you made is the one uh, with the sheep. So uh, <laughs> you guys can see it's it's hilarious. So you got to get on the Raz Solution YouTube site uh, right where this uh, podcast is going to be stored, in fact, um, and look through some of Cray's videos. You'll see the one with sheep. So Cray, tell us about the inspiration for that. Where did that come from? How did you come up with that idea? <laughs> Oh, I don't want to it? offend any. I don't want to offend any Kiwis here. It was um, a plug for a course we were doing in New Zealand, and so yeah, we zoomed in on a little sheep farm and uh, built walls around it, and just showed how you know you see analogs in everything you do, and so when you look from there and actually I, I can't take credit for that idea mark forrest um shows a photo of uh sheep herding um in one of his presentations and says look this looks like uh um you know uh, particle tracing and it does and so mm -hmm. I, I i found some videos of the same thing and then we tried to replicate it with a hecaraz model and again this is just something where in the courses that we teach um you know we recommend that you look look out there physics and science is the same everywhere you go 
yeah. people crowding in and out of a stadium door, um, when you get the constriction of flows and the flow separation lines and things like that, traffic, you know, you get the tail lights coming at you like a, like a backwater uh, energy wave and things like that. You know, you'll see analogs all over. And I, I like to look for those because I'm a water guy and I like to see it in everything we do. Yeah, yeah recently exactly. I've been doing some uh, electrical work in the house and it's uh, it's the same with electrical work. You know, you've got currents, you've got uh, resistance, uh, ohms right you've got voltage which is like potential energy uh or like a big reservoir right so uh yeah it's really uh really cool yeah i i had a excellent my before i got uh, into water resource engineering i interned at a transportation engineering firm and was talking with one of the transportation engineers there and in uh the grad school program that he was involved in they one of the required courses was actually a hydraulics course um it was taught kind of with a bend to traffic, but the concept was is that there are so many similarities between, like you were talking about, Craig, hydraulics and how traffic moves. That it was actually a, a requirement there. So that's I thought that sounded really, really, really cool, um, and is a, is a good example of what you're talking about. So. <laughs> yeah, very good. So, Craig, let's uh, let's move in. You've got uh, a, a hydraulic story you want to tell really quick before we get into the theme for today. The theme for yeah. today, by the way, is. Um, Rain on grid modeling in HECRAS. But before we get there, Craig's going to share a little something. Yeah, thanks. Um, I did want to chat a little bit about um, and follow up on what uh, you were presenting uh, last time around with uh, the project in Iran, which uh, seems to have uh, been uh, in Syria in that area, seems to have been the forefront of hydraulic engineering and modeling uh, back uh, in, in some of these areas that you see here in Google Earth. Um, it, you know, this is where uh, Archimedes and everybody else uh, started, uh, you know, introducing the original principles of uh, hydraulics. So one thing I wanted to uh, touch on, because we've just celebrated or memorialized um, Anzac Day here in Australia, which is like uh, the Memorial Day that you would have in the U.S. And one of the uh, main battles that is uh, highlighted in that uh, uh, in that memorialization, I guess, is the Battle of Gallipoli. So you see Greece here, um, and then what connects uh, you know the the two continents together at Istanbul. If you could connect them together here at Gallipoli, well. That that would be, um, you know, not just militarily, but um, also from a development standpoint, quite a feat. And what you find is there have been many attempts to actually span this bridge. Now we're talking in HECRAS about, uh, you know, currents going back and forth, and you can imagine some of the tremendous currents going across here in this peninsula. Well, why isn't there a bridge here? Most all peninsulas uh, around the world are connected uh, by a bridge if they're going to be this short. And as a matter of fact, there is a plan. Uh, to construct a bridge here. And it's actually a replacement bridge. Um, the replacement um, of the, the, this bridge actually replaces one of the longest bridge ever, bridges ever made in history. And it was actually constructed thousands of years ago by stringing a bunch of boats together and mooring them and having them reach the current. Well, I think they had elephants marching across them and everything else. Um, you know, they had military troops going across. It would take, I think they said the t crossing took days to get from one end to the other. And it was there. Can you imagine the engineering that goes into something like that and the forces on those mooring lines? Um, and so, you know, have a look at that, Google that and see what's going on. And one of the reasons I was thinking about this is somebody gave me the challenge a while back um, and asked me, can I model a pontoon bridge in Hegras? And, you know, this this is just for a brief discussion here. Maybe we can have some banter back and forth. You know, how would you do that when you think about a pontoon bridge that comes up and down and as the level changes? Um, have a look here at some of these things. Um, this one's in China, actually. Um, watch the uh, the ripples go through this one. Here's a floating bridge. Oh, wow. Um, try to really model cool. that. Um, and then something a little closer to home. You know, have a look here. Um, yeah, Chris and Ben, you'll recognize some of these things on the Columbia River. You know, what would happen if you, um, you know, blocked the flow on the top instead of the bottom? I mean, what if your friction's coming from the top um, in, instead of the bottom? What what happens to your N values or how could you go in and uh, model flow going underneath this? Does that require um, a, a 3D model? Um, you know, what, what could you do to model a pontoon? And and one of the reasons I'm thinking about this um, is because the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Guides, um, you know, if you're going to follow that strictly um, and do your modeling of culverts and bridges, 
you have to assess things for top uh, top down or bottom up blockage. And bottom up is fine. Everybody knows how to do that. But what about uh, top down? You know, floating debris that varies mm -hmm. with stage. So um, with that, I'll turn that back over and maybe just uh, yeah. you know, have a brief totally. discussion. What what would you do? How would you model a varying blockage from the top uh, instead of so a couple of things come to mind cray about that uh in hecras and and one is uh, you can do floating debris on piers in a bridge yep. uh, of course you're limited to doing that on piers so if you're trying to model a pontoon um uh bridge uh you would be limited to simulating the deck as debris on piers and so mm -hmm. maybe there are no piers so how would you do that uh, another thing that comes to mind is using um, ice. So in HECRAS, there's a little known feature um, called ice modeling, and you can actually have floating ice put on a river. Um, I will admit I have not done this other than playing around with it. I've never done a real project on it, but uh, it was actually added in several years ago, a long time ago in HECRAS, and it's still there. You can find it. And uh, this would possibly allow you to simulate um, a floating bridge or a floating house or something else floating on the river. Uh, you would just simulate it as quote unquote ice in Hecraz. Interesting. So I, yeah, I'd be interested to know uh, if anybody's ever tried anything like that. Please uh, let us know in the comments. Uh, I'd like to know about that and um, see if that's something that will help Cray out as he's uh, a modeling <laughs> top down debris type stuff in rivers. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe that'll have to be a special topic that we do, Chris. Maybe we'll dive into how to model ice like you're talking about. And and because I'm yeah. sure that would be applicable to a number of projects out there that people would be potentially interested in learning how to do that. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that story and that um, background on that really, really cool project, Craig. Uh, it definitely very different than the Shushtar hydraulic system that we looked at last uh, podcast, but still really cool and uh, uh, definitely would be an interesting one to see built into a HECRAS model. Um, awesome. So before we get into the topic for today, which again is going to be rain on grid and we're, we're all very excited for that discussion, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the uh, sponsor for this podcast. So uh, we are thankful to be sponsored by our firm, uh, Kleinschmidt Associates who is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. So thank you, Kleinschmidt, for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, all right, now we get into the, the meat and potatoes of today's discussion, and that is rain on grid. Uh, Cray and Chris and I have all had uh, discussions previously on rain on grid applications within HECRAS, uh, so we're excited to share some of that knowledge with you today. So we're gonna start off by just talking about uh, how to set up a rain on grid model. The, the, it's pretty simple actually. And some of the current limitations that go along with rain on grid within HECRAS, um, and maybe some of the fixes that are gonna come uh, for those features in the new 5.1 release. And then I'm gonna flip it back to Cray for some discussion and his experience with using uh, rain on grid and just some, some other things that he might uh, know or be willing to share with so for those of you guys who have never set up a rain on grid model, uh, again, it's, it's fairly simple. All you need is you need at least one 2D area and you need to add a boundary condition to that 2D area. So in this case, this was a project that Chris and I uh, were working on. This is an urban flood model. Um, and so we actually had multiple different 2D areas. I believe we had uh, to 13 different 2D areas. Uh, and so for each of these areas, we had to add a boundary condition of precipitation in order to account for rain on grid. So if you guys have never done that before, the way in which you add a boundary condition of precipitation to a 2D area, you have to uh, go to your unsteady flow data editor. Under boundary conditions, if you have, again, if you have a 2D area already created, you can add a SA2D flow area and you go down and you would select uh, either a single 2D area or multiple if you have multiple of them. And you'll notice that it's, it shows up actually here as selected storage areas for boundary conditions, but uh, this represents both storage areas and uh, 2D mesh areas. So uh, either of those options you're able to select for, for rain on grid. Um, once you select that, you'll see that uh, 
that perimeter or that 2D area will show up in your boundary condi conditions list. And uh, if you click on the boundary condition option, you'll get a number of different options. Um, and the one that we're gonna focus on today is this precipitation button here. Okay? Once you select a precipitation boundary condition, uh, your 2D area will automatically have an associated precipitation hydrograph that you can edit and add rainfall to. So if you click on that precipitation uh, boundary condition, what it ends up looking like is this precipitation hy hy uh, hydrograph function, which looks very similar to a 1D inflow hydrograph function that everybody that's used uh, HECRAS 1D is, is very accustomed to. So you have your date and your simulation hour. You can change the time interval that you want your precipitation hydrograph to be input as. Um, and then you just simply input the precipitation depths incrementally uh, into this. And, and what you what results is a precipitation hydrograph that looks very similar to an inflow hydrograph, but instead of uh, flow and CFS, it is precipitation in inches if you're using imperial units. Uh, the one really important thing to note about this is that this precipitation is excess precipitation. And what that means is that since there is currently no way to include spatially varied infiltration in a 2D model, this precipitation needs to account for any infiltration that you want to represent across your 2D area. Um, so in maybe in a simplified case, you're just going to assume that you're not going to have any uh, infiltration, in which case you can just simply uh, put the precipitation hydrograph uh, represented by a rain gauge or some other storm event that you have data for. Um, but in this case, we actually wanted to represent some infiltration. So we used HEC HMS to come up with an excess precipitation hydrograph. Uh, that included the infiltration already taken out, and we added that excess precipitation hydrograph uh, to this precipitation boundary condition. Um, so once you have that in there, you go ahead and run your simulation uh, using the unsteady flow uh, analysis window, like ever, like you're used to if you've done this before, and the results will show uh, rainfall falling on that 2D area and moving around based on the 2D hydraulic equations that are built into HECRAS. So Again, really, really simple to set up and execute, uh, maybe a little bit more complicated for things like calibration or actually finding the rainfall data, but uh, relatively pretty easy compared to setting up, for instance, a 1D model and the boundary conditions associated with that. So again, that's just kind of a background on how to set up a, a 2D rain on grid model. Cray, what are your thoughts or some, some other points that you want to include in this discussion? Yeah, um, one thing that you may be interested in, um, we've got a series of webinars that the Australian Water School has put together. Um, one of them was done together with Mark Forrest, um, and I think Chris might have been involved in that one as well, with um, where, where we covered rain on grid modeling uh, for you know a good hour, um, and and went through the example of uh, setting one up uh, from scratch basically and and doing it in 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 HECRAS. Um, so there are some resources available to you, um, but also some big concerns. Um, I, once, uh, maybe maybe after a little bit of discussion here, I'll, I'll show you a couple of uh, video clips of um, you know some some things that uh, we we might want to be aware of. In particular, um, you know what what happens when you run a hydrological model versus the hydraulic rain on grid model. It, it, the results generally aren't going to match up. Um, it's two completely different physical mechanisms, the way they're being computed. And a lot of times, even though it looks more accurate, looks cooler in your 2D rain on grid model, um, it may not be giving you the most accurate math answers. And you probably are going to have to calibrate it to the hydrology, which has been calibrated over decades in some places where they know this given rainfall is going to result in this runoff. Well, the first time you run it through rain on grid, it's probably not going to give you that answer. So any thoughts on uh, calibration? Have you ended up with answers that were way different and haven't the things? And what would you tweak? Well, well a couple things come to mind to me when, when talking about rain on grid, things that you definitely want to keep an eye out for, you want to be careful about. And this, this certainly plays right into calibration, and that is what end value do you use when you have literally just drops of water moving across terrain? Um, rain has just started to fall. Um, some call it sheet flow, um, but it's it's certainly not river flow. It's uh, not even floodplain flow. This is just uh, water moving through the ground. Um, 
it's on the order of the, the depth of that water is on the order of magnitude of the roughness elements themselves. And I've talked a lot about this in my class before and in other uh, venues where when you're at that spot where the depth of water is on the same order of magnitude as the roughness elements themselves, the end value skyrockets, it goes way up. So if you've ever um, tried to calibrate a rain on grid model, especially early on in the event, uh, or in areas that are typically not modeled by the river um, or, or by Hecraz as a river um, out in the fringes of the catchment, let's say, um, those end values should be very high, very high um, compared to what you would use for, say, a river or what you would get out of um, Chow or Barnes or some of those other end value books. The other thing, too, is speed to run these kinds of models, these rain on grids, grid models, mm -hmm. because when you start raining on your grid the or on your mesh the entire mesh gets rained on uniformly at least in the current version of RAS. so every single cell is activated whereas in um, a typical river model uh, if you're modeling an event and it starts off low and goes high and comes back down you're not using many of the cells maybe even a majority of the cells aren't used for a big portion of your simulation whereas in rain on grid Every time there's rain, every single cell in that 2D area is used, and that makes for a lot more computations and much longer running models. So be careful about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's a good point, Chris. And, I, you know, to Cray, to answer your question that you had kind of proposed, I think there, there's, you know, the biggest thing that we've found is that the larger area that you're trying to model with rain on grid, the more those problems are going to reveal themselves. For instance, if you're trying to model rain on grid of the Columbia River Basin, which is a massive river in Washington state, um, you're going to see a lot more of those differences as far as timing and peak than you would if you were, for instance, modeling a rain on grid uh, for just a smaller basin or maybe just a, a square mile or something like that. Uh, there still is going to be differences and it's still important to know um, the limitations with that, but it's magnified the larger area um, based on the larger area that you model. So the particular project that I was just highlighting there was a few square miles. Um, and so, and it was a, a very um, low slope system. So very, very flat, very low velocities. Um, and so we had pretty good success actually calibrating two um, peak, uh, known peak water surface elevations, but uh, definitely struggled with timing, um, which again, isn't surprising based on kind of what you were covering with the differences between hydrologic models and, and hydraulic modeling. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed as well, um, watch out when you turn on your adapt of time steps because your current number um, if if you just have river flow that's coming in at a half a percent or tenth of a percent or something like that and typical river velocities well that's your current number is going to be you know what, whatever it ends up being compare that to the current number you would get um, if you start running down the watershed or catchment slopes at 10, 20, 30, 40 percent slopes in some cases and so your velocities can speed way up um, down some of these concentrated channels. And when you drop rain everywhere, including on the steep slopes, that adaptive time step can really slow you down. Yeah. So have you found, Cray, that you've done uh, mostly uh, a static time step then when you do rain on grid just to avoid those issues? Uh, yeah, sometimes I'll back off to that. Uh, I do a little comparison. I'll run one overnight or over a couple of days and uh, then compare it to a static time step. And usually the little instabilities that you get up in the upper uh, watershed areas don't make a big difference in the results but i, I always run the comparison uh, i i tend to not release a model that i haven't run an adaptive time step just to check at least once uh what would hecraz tell me to use and then at least i can, would have to justify any uh course or time step that i might use right 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 so um, yeah. yeah i might just share real quick um one little hack um you know you mentioned those roughness coefficients um let me just uh go back to the screen share here and see if you can see this. Um, again, these are just some recycled slides from some previous presentations. Are you seeing that okay? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. So um, on these ones here, you can see some of these people, um, you know, uh, this is a like a fifth grade science project that's very easy to make. Um, just pour some water on some of these things and you'll end up being able to uh, simulate hydrology, basically. You've got rain coming into this thing and your hydrological model, um, and I, I, I build some of these and bring them with uh, to some of our courses sometimes uh, just to show uh, how this actually works. Our ontological model, you'll take some coefficients, some curve numbers, some infiltration rates, and you'll actually define mathematically how the rainfall and runoff are related. Um, and, you know, if, of course, if you vegetate it more, um, you're going to have a slow lower bonds and the timing of the water coming out uh, is going to be affected uh, by the parameters that are built in. So a hydrological model is just a bunch of these things stitched together with given parameters. Now the hydraulic model on the other hand, um, this is again just from one of our uh, webinar presentations, I always bring these little toys with to our courses. Mm -hmm. um, this is your pixelated DEM basically. So you got say it's a one meter by one meter DEM and on that DEM that defines your terrain surface, we can put some river channels and things like that. Um, now, when you do it in rain on grid, I always bring my brownie pan along and slice it with my computational grid, which can be much larger than your LIDAR grid or your DEM grid. And then we pour water right over the top of it. But here's what we do. And this, is, Chris, is what you were talking about. We are stuck at the moment in heck. Um, at having to do, um, you know, a temporal pattern you can do, but you can't spatially vary it. So I'm pushing that down here constantly. You can change the rate at which you push it, but see that slope? If I ran a rolling pin or a baker's pin across that, that you cannot do yet unless, like you were showing there, you're going to simulate that that, um, uh, you know, with, with multiple 2D areas that each get their own pattern. So mm -hmm. everybody's looking forward to 5.1 when we can do that ourselves uh, um, and uh, not have to use that as a hack. Um, but I wanted to show you my quick hack. If it's useful, that's great. If not, just uh, ignore this. Um, <laughs> my quick hack for uh, going in and um, uh, editing these things here. Um, to give you a depth varying roughness coefficient. So, so I wanted to just highlight um, one of the limitations currently is um, depth varying roughness. And as Chris mentioned, when you have shallow flows um, out in a uh, sheet flow area, it's going to be very to, um, uh, you know, to, to use a single roughness coefficient to model everything because up in the upper floodplains where you've got cheap flow, you know, millimeters uh, deep, um, you might want a really high roughness, but in the deeper flows, you'd want a channel roughness. So one mistake I've seen people make uh, to just to apply a uniform uh, roughness to calibrate things. And so if I did that for this model and I let it rain here uh, on these upper catchments, and um, and let that rain kind of flow into the concentrated paths. So I've got rain hitting every single grid, and then it comes down into these concentrated flow paths. Um, in order to calibrate something to a given discharge rate, say I cut a, a cross section here and get the flow, and it gives me what the hydrological model says I should get. Well, if you used a really high roughness value to get the right rate here, your depths are gonna be incredibly overestimated in the channel and your velocities will be underestimated if you're trying to size your riprap. So my little hack for this, I'll just show you real quick. So one of the things I do is I get into the results and I will actually go in here and add a results map layer, take my depth and I'll export as many of these as I need at the maximum a polygon for say, I want half a meter deep. Anywhere that it's a half a meter deep, I'll get a, uh, a layer there. Then I'll go and do the same thing. Say I want it to be uh, five centimeters deep. And I add that map. Well, when I compute these maps, it's going to make a shape file for me. And what's the, with this shape file, I then go back in and I've got a few of these here that I did previously. Um, I would do this maybe five times if I really wanted to get that, uh, that detailed. And I would make a new Manning's end layer. And on the Manning's end layer, I'll bring these shape files in um, at these different uh, values. So you see each of these things here. And then I'll assign each one. Um, I can move them up or down and give them a different priority. Um, assign each one of these things with a different depth. I can give it a different value here. Say if it's one meter deep, it's going to be channel flow. If it's a half a meter deep, it's going to be, you know, something uh, a little greater. Um, I could go to, you know, to 
things that are a tenth of a meter deep, and that might be 0.1. And maybe the stuff that's only five centimeters deep is a point, you know, two or 0.25 or 0.3 or something like that. And mm. I, I can stitch this together, make a new layer here. I put it under my land use here, give it a depth varying roughness. And if I, um, I haven't done this entirely correctly with the order of things, but once I create that and link it together under the geometry associations here, I can associate that, get a depth varying roughness. In, and then when I turn on my Manning's end layer, you can see, and this, is, this only has three of the five that I've just done, but I'm just highlighting this when you um, open this up and check final end values. I've got you know sheet flow at 0.1 here, um, this the fringes here at 0.07, and then the channel at 0.03. That's my little, little hack. Um, I'll stop sharing there and uh, turn that back over to you and just awesome, see if that Craig. if you think that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. super helpful. That's a very clever idea, Cray, and uh, I think that's going to be useful for a lot of folks out there um, who are doing and and not just rain on grid either. I mean, you could do that um, with any kind of floodplain modeling as well. Meantime, you've got really shallow flows where uh, end values, you expect them to be much different, um, much higher than you would have in the river. Yeah, mm -hmm. watch out for those universal values. Some people put those into all their models and just use the deep. I see 0 0.06 coming up all the time. Now. I never used to see 0 0.06. <laughs> Once they make the default, I see hundreds from? of models with 0 0.06. I know. I know, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's really good. I think though, just one thing to note on that, it was, and you touched on it briefly, was the order of those uh, layers is really important, right? Because obviously if you have your smaller layers below the larger extent layers and the large extent layers will just cover everything. Um, so yep. the order there yeah, the is really, really key. Yep. Exactly. So that's really cool. Yeah. I hadn't seen that done before. Yeah, very good. Yeah, thanks, Cray, a lot for sharing that. In fact, I want to thank you for coming on to uh, this uh, vodcast, uh, this episode of Full Momentum. It's really cool seeing you and, and having you join us today. And we're uh, definitely going to have to bring you back again sometime soon uh, to talk about some other really cool hacks and tricks that you have. Uh, somehow, Cray, I think it's because when you own your own company, you're kind of, you're working all the time, right, Cray? And so you're always <laughs> looking for ways to, to do things faster and quicker and easier. And so I think just out of that necessity, you, you you develop all of these really cool workaround tricks. So thanks for sharing that with us. So uh, with that, uh, Ben, you have any parting comments? Um, no, you know, I think, again, thanks for coming, Cray. We'll definitely have to do this again on another topic, uh, especially once 5.1 gets released and we're all kind of exploring that and learning uh, the ins and outs of, of the functionality there. I think that will be a great time to to bring you back on. Uh, and yeah, so anybody who's listening right now, if you have any questions or comments on the topics that were covered today, please leave those uh, in the comment uh, discussion below this video. If you have any questions for Cray, you can leave, leave those there as well. Uh, make sure that if you're interested in signing up for that 1D, 2D HECRAS class, uh, make sure to uh, check out the link in this video or visit Chris or I's LinkedIn pages for, for the registration there as well. Uh, and yeah, just feel free to leave any questions or comments you guys have. We'd love to start a discussion and start bringing on some of the questions that you have into the, the, the discussions that we have on this podcast. So uh, again, thank you, Cray. Thank you, Chris. This has been Full Momentum and HEC RAS Podcast.